like to introduce Brian Malcolm Nicol and his wife, Nate Jane Nicol. Hello, hello Jane. Welcome, thank you for coming. And I think you prefer to be called Nick, is that right? We'll try and remember to do that. Is it all right if I call you Nick? All right. Nick, I'm just going to ask you to take the affirmation. Is that all right? <laughs> when I say take the affirmation, I'm going to read it to you and ask you to agree. Is that all right? Okay. Do you solemnly, sincerely, truly declare and affirm that the evidence you'll give before this commission will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. And don't call me Your Honour, please. <laughs> I'll call you Nick if you don't call me Your Honour. How's that? Is that a bargain? <laughs> All right. I'll leave you to Miss Joy Child. We need to turn your microphone on, I think. Yeah. That's better. Yeah, and Put just... your microphone on? Yep. Great. Yeah. Okay, Nick. Um, you are going to read your statement, aren't you? So, so I am. So we will start at paragraph two, but just before then, to give the commissioners an overview, you were 12 when you went into Labour. Jumping off the walls, I had so much energy. I think it would be called today ADHD. Um, I was always being punished for it, but I couldn't do anything about it because of this. I had a pretty hard time at school. By the age of 11, I was in child welfare care. I was. I was worried all the time and very emotionally insecure because of troubled family life. Two other siblings and... Two other siblings were in care also. Yes, yes. Um, my sister, my, two, two of my members, sisters, twin sisters, were brought up by an aunt. Uh, um, I was in... Other homes besides Lake Ellis, but Lake Ellis was way worse. Being in care made me feel I was just a piece of shit to the staff and authorities. There was never a caring environment and I never felt cared for or that anyone valued me. I had a, I had a disability. Instead of love and care and help with it, I got cruelty, torture and was made to feel worthless human being. My first placement was in Stemwell Road Boys Home, Christchurch. I don't remember anything of that happened there. After a couple of months there, I was moved on. Holdsworth. I next went to Holdsworth. I acted up even more than usual at Holdsworth because of being so upset at being taken away from my family. I was homesick. I ran away from there and was returned to put in a secure room. Barbados Street church incident. When I was 12, I was back in the family for a break. I got into trouble breaking and entering. There was also an incident when I climbed to the top of the Barbados Street Cathedral Church in Christchurch. I was just being naughty. When I got to the top, I thought it would be funny if I called out and said I was going to jump. Going to kill myself. I was just trying to get attention. I was upset because my parents for taking my sister to see her husband in the Invercargill Borstal. I'd had a lot of trouble in my life. My parents were not easily, really capable of looking after us. I'd been in care and hated it. I remember being taken to Lake Ellis by a social worker from Holsworth. I think I was, I think it was because they did not know how to control me. I was only 12. I understand, understood it was going to be because there was something wrong with me and I guess was going to fix it. We'll just pause you there, Nick, and could we put up document 002, which is the record of your admission.
well, uh, the admission says that Brian was admitted because he had a history of hysterical suicide gestures. Brian, how many hysterical suicide gestures had you done by that time? Well, from what memory I've got left, that's the only one I know of. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh. Only one. Only once. That was at, at Barbados. That was at Barbados Street, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in there, it also said on your admission that you were finding it hard to settle, and you'd come to the adolescent unit for a brief period. Yes. Okay. So can we now start at paragraph eleven? Um, it, it's. Well, just can you go down to that third line? We say it was an informal admission, and then. Hold on, we just, just, just. Is it possible to bring this up, or are you having trouble? Ah, something, something happened then. Just waiting to see if we can get the the paper up on the screen so everybody can see, see. it, but it might not be possible. Well, if it's not, we'll just carry on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's also a record that Dr. Lake saw me on the 26th of June, 1973, and told me that he wanted me to come to Lake Alice. I don't have a memory of this. The first memory I have seen him, I had a rubber guard in my mouth, and he was about to give me ECT for the first time. I think I was there from 26th of June to the 20th of December. I really oh, we've got, hang on, just, uh, sorry, sorry it's, it's popped up, oh. so just have a wee look there. So Nick, that's your, um, that's the document that was written up when you were put into the hospital where it talks about your hysterical type suicidal gestures, right? And that the diagnosis was hysterical character, character disorder. disorder. Okay. And that there was, the only background to that was the Barbados Street incident. Thank you. Okay, so if you could start at paragraph 12, Nick. I regularly received ECT at Lake Ellis. The first time I didn't know what I was in for. So when they called my name, when we were all in the day room, I willingly climbed the stairs with the nurse. After that, I was like, all, like the other boys. I had to be dragged up. I was terrified all the time of getting it. I got it heaps of times. The ECT was always unmodified. I never got any anaesthetic or muscle relaxant beforehand. It usually happened on a Friday. I believe, it was for, I believe it was for punishment if I did something bad during the week. I would definitely get it. Some weeks I got it even when I didn't think I'd done anything wrong. I would be in the dining room having lunch, and if a name was called out, I'd have to stay. Once everybody else left, I would be called to the second time and taken to the day room where we were locked in so we couldn't escape. After a while, the nurse would come down and drag me upstairs. I was often so petrified that I'd saw myself that they would put a mouth guard in my mouth and hold me down well, Dr. Leach gave me ECT. The ECT was would give me vicious pains in my head and make me feel dizzy. As it continued, the pain got worse. My arms and legs flailed about. It was absolute agony. You'd have fuzzy lines running through your brain. I'm not sure how long the ECT lasted each time. It was very hard to keep track of time. It seemed that how long you got it depended on how bad the staff thought you had been during the week. After ECT, I'd be in a state of shock for several hours. This is how long it would take me to recover. I would normally be taken to my day, day room, or but if I was really bad, I'd be taken to my bed. Now, Nick, I'm just going to pause you there and we'll have another another attempt to bring up a document which is one of the nursing notes, an entry in the nursing note.
And if we look at the note dated 6 September 1973, what a nurse has written is that Brian has been the cause of many upsets over the last few days, has the habit of showing off in front of the girls in class, annoying others during work periods, and extremely argumentative even when, he's in it, when he is at fault. Perhaps a further talk with Dr. Leakes in a session of ectonus therapy is indicated. So you've seen that note, haven't you? Have you got any comment on it? Um, no. I... No. So no. you were never told that you were getting it because you no. were showing off to the girls? No, you just, you just got what was given to you. Um, had no control. Thank you. We'll now continue. Paragraph 17. I tried to want to run away once and Dr. Leakes gave it to me on my feet as punishment. I recalled this memory of this when I was being interviewed by the police last year. In some ways, the pain was worse because it ran up into the rest of my body. Whereas when you had it in the head, it stayed there. I believe this is why I have trouble with pins and needles in my legs. My nursing notes say that I received ECT three times. I received them way more than that. Not long after being admitted to Lake Ellis, another patient who was, was about 14 or 15, I, can't, I won't name him, came on to me and made, made advances. He asked me to perform indecent acts on him. I wouldn't and told staff, but they punished me for trying to make, for lying by making me have more ECT. A few days later, said person raped me. He just did, did this about three, three, about, about three times over the next six weeks. When I told staff, they just laughed and called me a liar. He stopped when he found somebody else to do it to. All the boys knew he was what he was up to and cringed when he walked by. I don't remember being given any drugs at Lake Ellis, however, there was mention of medical notes that I received for aldehyde. This, believe, I believe this is true as I know I have blocked out so much. The worst things I recall was getting ECT and being raped. Except for being locked in, my, in the day room before ECT, I don't recall ever being put in seclusion or cells. Dr. Leakes only, I only met Dr. Leakes when he gave me ECT. I was terrified of him. I would see his crummy van coming, pulling up the rounds, and terror would run through me. I don't remember meeting him in time, at any time on a one-to-one. -one. Um, I don't, I don't remember the names of any other boys. I didn't make any friends. I was in such a state of terror and misery every minute of the day. The only thing I could focus on was survival. Just take a deep breath. I don't remember the name of any of the staff for the same reason. I do remember that being one who was nice to me, he took me home out a few times on outings and he took me to Wellington. However, now I wonder, what he just grooming me for sex? I don't remember people getting, going to school at Lake Ellis. I left my final school and could not read or write. I only learned to read in jail. I taught myself. I vaguely, vaguely remember getting critters if we were good they would spend at the shop. I will always vividly remember once at a meal time a mentally disabled boy was masturbating under the table and all of a sudden the staff member came in over and injected him in his penis right there in the middle of the dining room. It was the same table I, was, I saw the whole thing. The boy screamed the most horrifying screams I've he heard apart from those of having ECT. It was the most horrible thing. It is one of the memories that won't go away. I remember another mentally, I remember another dis disabled boy 
who would laugh all the time. I remember watching him get ECT and he was laughing even after it. Then Dr. Leakes pushed the button, knocked him out completely. I don't recall thinking that Maori boys were treated any different to the rest of us. You were, you were allowed to call home. I rang mum often. I told her what they were doing to me, but she didn't believe it. I would also complain to mum when I went home for the holidays. I told anyone and everyone what was happening to me. I'll just pause you there, Brian, and um, we will put up a letter that your mother wrote, um, document 005. If we can start at the beginning of it. Perhaps, Brian, I'm sorry, you read paragraph 31 first. Read paragraph 31 first. My mum wrote to Dr Leakes to complain about the lack of information about my progress. There is no date on the letter, but it would have been when I was there. OK, so we'll just pause you there. And that's a letter that, is that your mother's handwriting? I assume so. Yeah got your mother's name on it and she writes as you have our son Brian and it's written to Dr Leakes although you can't see that at the top as you have our son Brian Malcolm Nickel under your care we were wondering if there was a possibility of our obtaining any information as to his illness and possible future well-being our area child welfare officer does not to seem to receive very much of any information about Brian he did not even know he was in hospital until I rang him after receiving a letter from Brian. Also, Brian has told us that he has had ECT. Whether this is true or not, we don't know. Mr. Mentha could not enlighten us as he didn't know whether it was true or not. I wondered if you knew that Brian had had an ECG at Dunedin Public Hospital in 69, it would have been between February or thereabouts. And then he says, my husband remembers you when he was a patient at Cherry Farm and discusses that. Then um, later on, we go to paragraph three. So mum is wondering if Brian has had some problems based on his past and her pregnancy. Then at the end of paragraph three, she says, Mum says that, um, yes, Brian, until he became a state ward, no one took any notice of me. Lack of security and also the fact that he was actually taken before a magistrate in the children's court have not helped him at all. In fact, I would consider it all to have been major factors in his emotional disturbance. I know Brian is very sensitive, thin-skinned, but he has never had the opportunities to develop what skills he does possess. He stayed with friends in Wellington Trice and never had a moment's trouble. Stayed with friends and nothing but trouble. I only hope you may be give, able to give us some information and tell us if he would be allowed home for a holiday. I know he's a state ward, but after all, I am his mother and I've carried the burden while doctors, and she gives an exception to Dr. King, oh, Dr. Kincaid in particular, and other officials, with the exception of the public health nurse in Mosgiel, laughed about Brian needing some <coughs> expert help and attention. So your mum's written a letter to Dr. Leakes, yes. explaining a bit about you and why you are the way you are. Yes. She's not said anything about you having a mental illness, has she? No. Okay. Now you are up to paragraph 31, and we were at the third line. <coughs> Um, there is a 1977 letter to Dr Pugmire, the medical superintendent of, at Lake Ellis, from Dr Merrams, asking about an allegation that Mum called Lake Ellis at Christmas 73 and was told by my care was none of her business. I was a state ward. The response from Dr Pugmire accepts this is the sort of thing she would have been told at the time. Okay, now we'll pause you there and we'll look at the letter. So obviously your mum's been upset that she hasn't got news from Dr Leakes. She's written to um, the Director General of Health. He's asked 
the superintendent, Dr. Pagma, to reply and explain the story. And Dr. Pagma writes, replying to your inquiry, our records show the above patient was admitted informally and discharged on such and such a date. At the time he was 12 years of age and diagnosed as suffering from hysterical character disorder. Once again, the fact that you had a history of suicidal gestures is repeated when it's not true, plus a great deal of breaking and entering and petty thieving. So he goes on and describes your history, and then he says in the second paragraph, regarding the mother's allegation that at Christmas 1973, she rang the hospital to inquire whether her son was a patient, and she was told, he is a state ward, it's none of your business. Dr. Pugmire writes, Although the quotation of the words may not be quite accurate, I would think that is the sort of thing that would be said at that particular time, because the theoretical basis of therapy was that children's illnesses were caused by their parents, and parents, children and therapists should be under no delusions as to the truth of this matter. The intensity of hostility towards parents was very high, and it was because of complaints of this nature that I have tried to so hard and so continuously to bring about changes. And then he talks about the fact that there are now changes. This is in June 77, four years after Brian was there. Now, Brian, we now understand that your mother wrote... Yes, yeah. Okay, now... You all right to carry on, Nick? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. All right. We'll, we'll just read now from paragraph 32 about your life after Lake Ellis. I was discharged from Lake Ellis on the 20th December 1973. I was 12 years old. I was released to a foster care in Levin. That didn't last very long before they asked her for me to be removed. I was sent to Hokio Boys, Hokio Beach Boys Home. I then was sent there because my behaviour had still not improved. I was irrit irritable and angry because of what happened. What happened to me when I first arrived there? I was rolled in a blanket, and the other boys beat the shit out of me. I remember at Holes at uh, Hokio, so I had done something wrong, I may have broken into a staff member's car. I was made to be in push-up position, holding my body at half-mast for an hour, over an hour. It was agony. Kawateri. I was then sent to Kawateri Boys Home in Levin. Again, I had an initiation ritual. This one did not involve a blanket. I was beaten up pretty badly. I still have scars on my face from it. I did about 18 months there. The staff knew I was ha knew what was ha knew it was happening, but they turned a blind eye. Um, I lost a finger in Kawateri, and it was in the woodwork shop. And someone came up behind me and said, "All going okay?" Gave me a slap on the back. My hand went through the blade, and the vent saw I was using at the time. I got ACC cover for it, but it was only 1,400. After the incident, I tried to do a runner and ended up being put in the pound for it. At the age of 15, I was sent back to my parents in Gore. I remember again telling my parents about the UCT in Lake Ellis, but they never believed me. They thought I was making up stories. I went to St Peter's College, but only lasted a few weeks before I got expelled. I rebelled against authority because of Lake Ellis. I tried to run a teacher over my friend's money because the teachers sent to came me, which I saw as a form of authority, the police were involved. I'll look out Point Boys Home, Dunedin. Social Welfare then sent me to look out Point Boys Home in Dunedin. Eventually, I was sent back home. Family visits went in boys' homes. <laughs> and all my time in boys' homes, apart from Stanmore Road, I can only remember two family visits. Um, can I pause you there, Brian? Nick, was part of that because you were in the, from your family was in the South Island? Yeah, I think so. I, I had a brother um, down in Wellington, my oldest mm -hmm. brother at the time, mm -hmm. um, and he was the only one I saw there. Uh, it was 
Kaltiri. Right. I can't, I, mm. I just, mm. yeah, sorry, it's... No problem. I think the, the, the point bit is, is, Nick, that you hardly saw your family when you were at boys' homes, is I that right? I hardly saw them at all. At all, um, yeah. Yeah, the only time I saw family members was, as I say, when I was, I was there to go home on holiday. Mm. Um, or as I, my brother came to see me once and my sister came to see me once at um, Kaltiri. Yeah. Um, and that's the only family visits that I know of. That's uh, over some years. It was over a couple of three years, yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So I never saw my family members or anyone. Mm. It's it, very tough, isn't it? It was just, you know, I shouldn't have had to be put through it. None of us should have been. No. No, I agree. <sighs> mm. Are you okay? Yeah. Where are we? We're at paragraph 41. Leaving state care, when I first started working, I worked twice as hard as anyone else, as I was always trying to prove myself. I was always trying to please people too. I would do anything for anyone. Later that was, a de to be later that was to the detriment of my family. I also, I also couldn't handle stress. I started heavy drinking and taking drugs. I was trying to block out everything that happened to me. In 77, I was in prison for 11 months, also for driving while disqualified. I went through so many hidings at, at Borstal, I can't remember why. My head smashed another, by another boy at the time, one of the times. Drinking and wandering. For the next seven years, I roamed up and down the South Island. I was really lost because of what my childhood, and especially Lake Ellis, had done to me. Over those seven years, I got one driving conviction for drink driving in jail, term for driving while disqualified. My oldest child, stepdaughter, um, was born in 83. In 85, I voluntary went to Claremont Recovery Centre to sort out my alcohol problem. I spent four or five months there and decided to start a new life in Omaru. I did spend one last time in jail, Christmas 85, failure to pay fines. While in Omaru, in 1986, I met my wife. She's been, she's been in state care as a teenager and forced to give up her baby, which she conceived with while in care. She understood me. She's endlessly patient with me. I believe it'd be dead long ago if it wasn't for her. Our son was born in 1987 and I got married on the 11th of June, 88. Things really began to settle down for me. My youngest child, my son, was born in 89. I spent most of the 90s working in construction. Yeah. That's my mistake, not yours. Yeah, that, that's, why, <laughs> that's why I corrected it as I went through it. Good, thank you. Uh, uh, where am I? Paragraph 48. In October 2001, I received $64,912 settlement from the Crown for my abuse at Lake Ellis. Grant Cameron charged me $27,500 and $56 in legal fees. I thought that was way too much and unfair. I thought the government would pay for them in the settlement. Later I learned that the government had paid for the second lot of claimants, but not ours. Now we'll just pause you there and we'll look at the statement you got from Grant Cameron, document 007. So this shows that, um, that a total of 65,000 was paid to you, and yeah. the fee on the attached invoice was 25900 and then there were disbursements of 1597 So the amount that you got was um, 36839 How did you feel about getting that amount when so much was taken off? Really, the money wasn't an issue. 
um, he took what he took, but my, my output from the start has always been public apology to us for what was done to us and an assurance that it never happened to a child again because we were only kids, we were babies. Right. So money's, money is not, not an issue. You have said in your statement though that it was unfair that Cameron, that the government didn't pay your legal fees. Yeah, yep. they should have paid the fees. Yep. We were only a trial case and we, well I can't even say we won. It was a deal broken between him and the government at the time. How involved were you with the um, opportunity to settle your case? Yeah, um, oh, sorry. Did you, were you involved in the negotiations? How did you find out what the offer was? Um, just by letter. Um, and then yeah, my, sister, my sister Mary, she's the one that, as I say, did all the work. Right. Um, and yeah, it just didn't seem fair, it didn't seem right. You know, what was taken from us can never be replaced. <coughs> okay, and now at paragraph 49. After giving my statement for the case, I had a breakdown. I was reliving all the trauma my doc. I was reliving all the trauma. My doctor at the time gave me an antidepressant Arapax 20. I'm oh, sorry, Arapax. And his attitude was that shit happens and I had to get on with my life. I had a severe allergic reaction to the Arapax. So did you stop taking it? I was, I was yeah, well, I blew from the size I am now to like a balloon. I just, I just, the whole body just swelled up. So I was lucky to walk away from that one. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 50. 2020 documentary. I took part in the TV documentary on what happened in Lake Ellis in 2001. Grant Cameron had asked if we wanted to talk to the media and I had said yes. The TV people flew me to, up to Lake Ellis. I showed, I showed the crew around the buildings and what had happened in the buildings. There was a nurse and a journalist and a woman who had been in Lake Ellis as a teenager we pointed out dormitories, the day rooms, ECT rooms. Okay. Yeah. I, I fell to pieces after visiting, visiting Lake Ellis again and doing the documentary. I had a total mental breakdown this time. I went from being a healthy, fit dairy worker to being an old man almost overnight. I was, I was, I was a human wreck. I'd lost lots of weight. I had a very understanding bosses, but I just couldn't handle the stress. I would go overboard. I could not work. I had to go on an invalid's benefit. I've been on. Uh, I had to go onto an invalid's benefit. I've been on income support ever since. ACC in January 2002, I was granted ACC cover for the rape of me in Lake Alice but nothing for anything else that happened there. I remember, I remember an assessor telling me that they would only cover me for the rape and made me repeat that the cover was only for the rape. Effects of Blake Ellis in my life, nerve and body pain. My life had been totally screwed up following the treatment I got at Lake Ellis. I have lots of pain all the time it started when I came out of and has got worse over time. I have terrible pins and needles in my feet and over the years they've gone up my legs. Often the only way I can get relief is to sit on my legs and feet tucked on behind me to get for my legs to go numb. So I wouldn't, yeah. My muscles are all knotted up. They start knotting up in Lake Ellis and have never stopped. Intrusive memories. I'm still, I'm still haunted by the trauma of Lake Ellis. I lived it in my mind and body daily, and particularly the memories of being raped, of the men mentality, mentally disabled boy being injected in his penis, the sort of a small urine, the smell of urine and feces swelling up in our pants, 
drifting down in the East Wall waiting for ECT and I'm begging for help from being sexually abused but but being called a liar and being punished for it these are the worst memories they flesh up daily <sighs> severely damaged memory my memory has always been totally shot really screwed up since Lake Ellis I can't remember the simplest things I believe this is because of the ECT He's, oh, I will forget how to do simple things all the time even when I see my wife doing it a hundred times I forget what she said to me I've been through so much trauma it's difficult to recall everything that happened to me lack of trust I have a huge trust issue with people my wife has suffered for this and has it is very hard to trust, to be a trusting inmate. Hard, 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 and, hard and trusting to be intimate. I was taught to protect myself no matter the cost of those around me. We've been married since 88, and up until recently, I haven't told her much about Lake Ellis at all. I've told her the details about three years ago for the first time. Because I was taught down the truth was wrong and I was punished with ECT for it. Um, oh, where am I? Paragraph 58, um, second line. Uh, I've gone through life lying to those I love because they, mm -hmm. the government, taught me to lie. I have unknowingly taught my children to lie and they have done the same to their children. My kids suffer an ability to parent well impact on children. My kids suffered for this. I've led a very unsettled life with 30 moves while the kids were at home. I wasn't a good father. Nobody ever taught me how to be a father. I found the noise difficult and I wanted to withdraw from them all. The all the time, I couldn't cope with the knees because I was able to. I wasn't able to cope with my own. I was coping with my trauma. At the, I was coping with my trauma at the time. All the time, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I started drinking numb memories. I'm proud that I haven't drunk alcohol for 14 years, thereabouts. Because of the very limited food we were given in care, meat and three veg, I have difficulty trying new foods. It's taken 30 years to let my wife use garlic and cooking, let alone herbs and spices. What do I want from the Royal Commission? For me, this case has always been about proper apology from the government and to make sure it never happened to the child again. That is my priority. I've, I have had years of lost income as a result of my so-called treatment. I think the government should compensate me for this. I also want my legal fees returned with interest. They should have been paid for by the government. And I want legal proceedings to, instituted against those who perpetrated these atrocities against myself and other residents of Lake Ellis. Thank you, Nick. Oh, if you just sit there and the commissioners may ask you questions. Yeah. Right. Paul, do you have any questions? No. What about you, Right. Nick, we're not going to ask you any more questions. You've been eloquent and everything you say here has just leapt out of the page because of your courage in coming to say it directly to us. Um, it's quite obvious to all of us that you tried so hard to put Lake Ellis behind you mm. and the other awful times you had at the boys and residence, residential homes, but that you were severely triggered by bringing it to light. 
And that is the worst irony for me. That is the worst thing. You suffered so badly. You succeeded in your life, your description of life on the farm and your success at that time. And yet it was all brought down by trying to seek justice. Yeah. And that seems to me the most inherently unfair thing. And so just to let you know that we recognise that coming here today is probably going to harm you again. It will do, for sure. And for that we are deeply sorry, but enormously grateful. Because it's only your courage and those of your other uh, survivors who suffered that, that we can tell this story at last in the open. Uh, all I can say is that I hope you take whatever well-being support that we can offer you and that maybe um, some lasting effects from that can be felt. But I just urge you to look after yourself. I'm sure your loyal wife is going to help, but um, it, it takes strength. I mean, you, in all this awfulness, two big things have stuck out for me and you've done both by yourself. One. When the government, the state, failed to give you an education, you taught yourself to read. And write. And write. And the second thing, the alcoholism which overtook you, you have defeated that by yourself. Oh, not by myself. Well, you were helped, but you did it. You can't do it without yourself Definitely. being right at the centre. And that shows real resilience and courage and again demonstrated by coming here today. So a grateful thanks to you. And as I say, do take care and take whatever well-being we can help you to see you through this next few difficult day days. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you. I think we'll take a brief adjournment and I think we're going, will we continue then with the next evidence? Um, if we... I think we will need the luncheon adjournment, but we won't before the next witness. But it, oh. we can come back much. much so earlier. we're going to we're going to take a take a break now. Is that right? Yes. All right. A lunch break. A lunch break now. Oh, good lunch. That's a good thing. Maybe you'll even have some garlic with your lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> Should we perhaps come back at one thirty? Yes, I think we'll come back at one thirty. And before we go, can I just say that we are commissioners are very tired of having. To, getting people standing up and sitting down every time we come in and out. I think it's unnecessary. And so if you can restrain yourselves, that when we leave, please do not stand up. And please do not uh, stand up when we come in again. We, you will, you'll be invited to stay sitting. I saw some of you instinctively leaping up. Uh, it's time to uh, learn that. It's not appropriate. We will stand at the beginning of our day for the Waiata Karakia, and we'll do the same at the end. But otherwise, Please remain seated if you can discipline yourselves to do that. <laughs> right, we'll take the lunch adjournment and we'll come back at 1.30. The sitting is adjourned. <laughs>